Mexico. Um, this uh, this talk um, has been in preparation for a long time and it was the result of a number of things, mostly um, you know, not being uh, kept awake at night exclusively by party dars and, and uh, house alarms in our neighborhood, but also thinking about infectious diseases and climate change, which is something that um, is pretty hard to ignore, um, especially for those of us who read the news obsessively. Um, besides for, for climate change on its own, it's, it's become increasingly hard to untangle climate change's impact on infectious diseases. And it's not something that we necessarily focus on within our training or within our practice. Um, so I thought uh, we could just do a little intro to, to this concept. So this, um, um, this amazing little sculpture um, it has, has captivated me, I must say, for a long time. It, it's, uh, it's by a Spanish artist, Isaac Cordell, who, um, who does these incredible little um, ceramic sculptures. And I mean, you can see the stones in the road. So this is in a road um, in Berlin. And you can see the, uh, the stones. So this, this, this thing is, is, is really small. And it, this is actually just a little puddle in the side of the road. Um, its official name is Electoral Campaign. But uh, anyone who's on Twitter or Facebook will know that it's been colloquially dubbed uh, polit politicians discussing global warming. And this is a, a little sculpture that's, that he, he put in Berlin in 2011. This party based on, on real events, uh, uh, I'd imagine, and um, based on a governmental meeting that uh, politicians had in the Maldives in 2009, where the government at the time in what was an amazingly bold and provocative statement, I thought, held a cabinet meeting underwater. Okay, granted, it was uh, you know seven feet underwater. You can see the azure water um, uh, along the little jetty in the in the left hand image. But but still, I think the the the, the prospects of life for a lot of people in uh, large areas of the of the world and life. Uh, having to um, be negotiated around rising water levels, um, I thought was an incredibly powerful statement. Now, the the link between um, infectious diseases or illness and um, and weather related issues uh, is not a new concept, and it goes back at least two thousand years to the Hippocratic era. Um, he's largely known amongst us for his uh, clinical acumen and describing uh, a variety of, um, of diseases, clinical signs and conditions. But one of the things that really set him apart in the early days was that he um, looked at uh, theories relating disease to natural phenomena rather than um, uh, deities, gods and demons. Um, and he meticulously detailed um, clinical features uh, clinical signs and clinical observations, along with the wind, stars, waters, and seasons um, that were impacting on the on the patient at the time. This um, sort of theory grumbled along for at least the first millennium, where a lot of uh, epidemics at the time were explained by changes on the course of stars and atmospheric, meteorological, and terrestrial phenomena. And the, the, the concept of being under the weather um, was based on the association of some regions either having illness or good health. Uh, and it was a way that um, disease was explained uh, uh, between people who had little else in common with each other. And then in the 1300s, uh, bubonic plague came along and uh, weather-related and cosmological-related phenomena didn't really um, hold water in terms of explaining um, the disease process. <clears throat> From the 15th century onwards, um, once uh, plague um, really got going across uh, most of Europe, um, this was a time, of, uh, this was the first time when victims and household contacts were, were, seg were segregated. 
Um, and this reinforced the, the concept of um, diseases being caused by miasma. Now, a little bit later on in the 1600s, this is where mete meteorology and medicine um, really came together. Um, this was a period of amazing scientific discovery and revolution. Uh, a number of uh, measuring gizmos, hydrometers, microscopes, all of the variety of neurological um, uh, uh, devices were, um, were designed and, and invented. And these were largely um, well supported and sponsored by the big academies and scientific societies of the time. So much so that by the late 18th century, um, these, these discoveries um, uh, produced uh, amazingly practical um, uh, applications where uh, city structures, infrastructures, sewers, water management for prisons and, and uh, epidemiology of certain areas um, being associated with disease or death, um, these things became uh, increasingly common. Now we cut to the, to the 20th century. So I'm, I think technically I'm a zennial uh, from the late 70s. So when I was growing up, the ozone layer uh, um, and uh, CFCs were the big thing. But one of the main um, sort of uh, explanations uh, from a weather-based point of view, um, one of the main observations that, that really changed the, the, the dynamic of this field enormously was um, the descriptions of the El Nino phenomenon. And this allowed successful forecasting of weather events. Um, it really changed the outlook of predictive meteorolo meteorology and also renewed interest in the history of, uh, of weather events. Um, this graphic um, from a recent Nature article uh, really gives a, what I thought a really cool, beautiful, interesting overview of how disease and infections and the dynamics of how these things are, are, are spread um, over the years, starting from um, two, two millennia ago, where illness was largely uh, based on, or the spread of illness was largely based on trade uh, and war. Uh, I think that's green. I'm, I'm told it's green. Um, colonial um, spreads in the 15th to the 18th centuries that we see uh, um, in the Columbus and post-Columbus era, um, largely uh, being responsible for smallpox, measles. And when I think they, they euphemistically say other diseases, uh, I'm pretty sure syphilis um, is, uh, is there somewhere. Back to the slave trade where um, large portions of the population from, from Sub-Saharan and West Africa uh, taken to the Caribbean and um, uh, south eastern portion of the United States uh, sort of drove um, falciparum or plasmodium spread. And then uh, a more recent example that we're all familiar with, um, starting on the right-hand side, the SARS um, uh, epidemic. So <clears throat> let's uh, move on to climate change primer. Um, this uh, little dad joke would probably only be appreciated by uh, maybe one person in the audience, and I think that's probably Robin, but uh, it's setting the scene, um, and the whole scene is something that we'll chat about in a couple of minutes. So, thanks to Robin uh, for, for these slides. Um, it really felt like I was going back to uh, first year varsity, um, except I was a lot more clueless when, when going through we're going through these slides. So just to cover some basics. Atmosphere is the thin layer of gases um, surrounding the earth. And the bottom layer is the troposphere and it contains the air that we breathe and a number of different aspects of the weather that, that we experience. Some of the infrared energy from the sun penetrates the atmosphere and it warms the earth's surface. And this infra infrared energy is then re-radiated off the energy surface back towards space. Um, and some of that energy is kept at the surface um, by the troposphere. Uh, this graphic uh, summarizes um, in, uh, uh, in actual numbers the, 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 the dynamic uh, movement of, of radiation energy and the sort of cumulative effect of having solar radiation um, hitting the Earth's surface. Some of it 
uh, re-radiated back out into space. But a lot of it, um, or some of it at least, stays within, um, as a result of greenhouse gases, it stays with, within the troposphere um, and then sets up a sort of bouncing ball uh, process where this energy remains within, uh, within our um, uh, Earth surface. So <clears throat> greenhouse gases have caused the mean global temperature to increase by so far a centimeter above the pre-industrial levels. And the, the, the consequences of this, um, as we have seen almost daily and as we sometimes experience, um, the consequences of this are, are enormous. The increased number of warm days and nights, decreased cold days and nights, um, extreme weather events are, are on the up, there's reduced snow cover uh, and accelerated sea levels rising. Um, this is from uh, a great review article in the NEJM last year, which, which dealt with the infectious diseases uh, implications of, of climate change. And it just shows the average uh, temperature change uh, in the last 50 years, comparing sort of the 2011 to 2020, to the 50s and 60s. Um, and we see that overall, um, there's a between a half and a, a degree uh, increase um, in temperature. Of, of note, I must just say, uh, the portion in the Southern Africa, you'll see that um, uh, this on a sort of geological and meteorological level confirms that the uh, the Western Cape um, not only is a separate country, but a, a, a separate sort of meteorological uh, entity as well, which um, is quite interesting. Uh, most of the changes um, and the, ex the extremities of changes are noted in, in the highlands and the, and the polar regions. Um, and what's, what's really uh, of great concern is that in the tropical regions, the temperatures are reaching um, thermal limits of, of many organisms. So uh, something that's um, often encountered in the media and um, in the news is, uh, is this, this issue of the 1.5 degrees. So what's it all about? So in 2015, um, the majority of countries around the world adopted uh, the Paris Agreement, uh, and the main aim of which was to limit the global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees above the pre-industrial um, levels. So how close are we to, to 1.5 degrees? So in, in around 2017, we reached about um, a degree uh, higher than pre-industrial levels. Uh, and we set to reach 1.5 degrees um, by the late sort of 2030s, maybe 2040, uh, if we carry on at the, at the current rate. This... Um, this graphic just shows the, the Holocene period, which is the last, give or take, 11 and a half thousand years, um, and how there, there are variations uh, over time in temperatures and there are fluctuations that are considered um, a part of uh, um, the cycles that, that the planet has experienced. Um, but we see a great anomaly um, on the right-hand side of the picture where there's this um, significant um, incline in the uh, expected temperatures that um, we'll be experiencing. So if we can continue the current trend, um, by the end of the century, we're looking at uh, four to five degrees above pre-industrial levels. And this is going to lead to the dramatic intensification of changes that we're already experiencing. And um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is uh, um, a group that's often mentioned in a lot of climate change literature and a lot of um, reporting on the issue, um, mentioned that if um, there's continued emission of greenhouse gases, this will cause further warming, long lasting changes in all components of the climate system, increasing the likelihood of severe, pervasive and irreversible impact for people and ecosystems. This image um, it just shows the um, potential change in temperature if we carry on at the rate we're going. From 2000, uh, uh, the map on the top 
to the end of the century, 2100, where we see that the rate of change of the temperatures is heading towards about four or five degrees um, by 2100, 2100. Um, all pretty bleak, uh, one might say, but I must say um, it does make things a little easier when we see things represented graphically um, in such beautiful simplicity, um, as devastating and terrifying as this is. It's, uh, it does show Johannesburg's change in, in temperature from the late 1800s. and the motivation to try and reach the goal of 1.5 degrees. But um, a number of uh, publications are now saying, well, we need to move into a different phase. Yes, we must try and reach these goals, but there's a good chance we may not reach these goals and we need to maybe adjust our thinking and our expectations based on the possibility that um, if we... exactly looking like a possibility. This, uh, this quote from the article um, uh, in The Economist that I just showed um, quotes one of uh, Barack Obama's White House scientific advisors who, who was talking about how for us to reach uh, some of these goals, we needed to at least halve our fossil fuel use. And he asked, who believes that we can halve global emissions by 2030? Um, it's so completely outside the realm of technology and economics and politics of the world. Is it technically feasible? I guess, but it's so far from reality that it's kind of absurd. Okay, time for a timeline cleanse. This is um, the sort of greenhouse that, that I generally prefer to go for, um, something more architectural rather than meteorological. This is just one of the most magnificent examples of uh, Victorian architecture from the Crystal Palace Park um, in London showing uh, just a beautiful example of uh, um, the kind of greenhouse that really we should be we should be aiming for. When looking through the climate change literature it's quite striking um, the similarities of that and the vaccine science and anti sort of vaxa um, orbit that that we've had to uh, inhabit the last the last few years and there are a lot of things shared between uh, climate change and vaccine and infectious diseases uh, worlds uh, both are threats to personal community and global health um, action is contingent on cooperation and social policy and public support relies on trust in science now the the history of uh, of these concepts um there's nothing new. A lot of it goes back more than 200 years, where um, even at a time when uh, the smallpox vaccines um, were being rolled out, uh, there were medical um, medical staff who, who questioned the safety um, of these inoculations. And this um, image on the right from, from Montreal in the late 1800s just shows um, what were dubbed vaccine riots and daily for those of us on social media we have to encounter um some of this uh, this overlap between the uh, mentality and uh, um sort of theories surrounding climate change overlapping with um the with vaccine um with the the world of vaccines uh, i i guess uh, the name illuminati bot um should have been a clue should have been a bit of a warning but um, just to show that there are others in more senior positions like uh, the guy in the middle, who's a Fox News reporter, and RFK Jr., who's uh, running as a Democrat candidate um, in the US elections. And, and, and a lot of the overlaps involve distrusting science, promoting misinformation, um, 
politicizing conspiracy theories um, and relying on a lot of uh, alternative facts. So <clears throat> what's the impact of climate change on infectious diseases? So we're going to talk about it broadly and specifically. And three components um, when thinking about infectious um, agents are what's the pathogen, um, what's the host or the vector, and what's the transmission environment. Um, appropriate climate and weather conditions are needed for the survival, reproduction, distribution, and transmission of infectious diseases. And this, this graphic just shows the just a simple um, summary of, of how climate change um, uh, affects that sort of trio of factors um, and the resulting uh, clinical uh, scenarios that we do to that we do to cover. So, what's the climate change impact on on pathogens? So, there's a direct impact, um, which involves the survival, um, the reproduction life cycle um, being uh, increased um, for for some of the pathogens. And then there's indirect um, impact as well, which is through the habitat uh, environment or through other competitors of these pathogens that are affected. So it's not only the, the, the quantity of the, the pathogens, the sort of microbiological burden, but it's also the, the context in which we find them. So the geographical and the seasonal distribution um, of, the path of the pathogens. It's really hard to go a few days without encountering um, something in the news about an extreme uh, weather event. Uh, and this refers to the value of weather or climate variables going beyond the thresholds of the upper or lower ends of the observed values. And these are things that we, we encounter um, often, um, like El Nino and La Nina. So that's on a, on a sort of global scale. And then there's regional things that we encounter, like droughts, heat waves, and floods. And although overall these events are pretty rare, they make up sort of less than 5% of the time, their frequency and their intensity is, is on the rise. This um, really just shows one of the, uh, the, the climate issues that has probably one of the greatest impacts on infectious diseases, which is the shifting geographical range of, of species where the warming and precipitation changes leading to expansion of um, sort of the, the vectors, uh, a distribution, particularly mosquito, tick, uh, fleas. Um, and this has led to large outbreaks of a whole host of um, viruses like dengue and chikungunya and uh, um, uh, parasite, parasitic infections like, like malaria. Of note, also we'll talk a little bit about it later, is uh, warming at higher altitudes means that vectors survive winter. And this has led to all sorts of outbreaks of dengue um, and Zika. So what about weather issues that bring people closer to pathogens? So things like heat waves, where we um, are uh, attracted to water activities and exposed to waterborne diseases like uh, vibrio and gastro. Um, storms, floods, and sea levels rising cause human displacement. And this has been implicated in a whole host, uh, really just the most spectacularly long lift of uh, infectious diseases that, that result from um, water-related things like storms and floods. Um, and also land use changes have facilitated human encroachment um, into wild uh, wild areas. Um, and this we know from um, things like uh, Ebola and uh, uh, malaria as well. Are any pathogens actually strengthened by weather-related issues? Um, so besides for the increased contact between people and pathogens, there's also improved climate suitability for reproduction, uh, life cycles are accelerated and the seasons and length, length of exposure for some pathogens are, are increased. Warming has a positive effect on mosquito population development, um, survival, biting rates and viral replication. This, this is uh, one of the things that's been shown um, quite significantly in, uh, in West Nile virus. Um, ocean warming and precipitation um, reduces water salinity and this has created fertile conditions for Vibrio outbreaks. So this graphic really just shows the, the, the complexity of the relationship between a number of um, weather-related issues, the clinical scenarios that, that we have to deal with, like vector-borne or waterborne um, uh, infections, and just the multitude of infections that, that can occur as a result of these things. 
Um, and as you can see, there's no straight lines uh, and there's, there's, there's no single entity that, uh, that leads to one other single entity. So if one thinks about floods and the multitudes of uh, exposures that, that come with it, um, we really are, are dealing with an amazingly uh, complex set of variables. Whew, okay, who's ready for another timeline, Pens? <clears throat> Number two. A bit of good news is that um, there have been some uh, great developments uh, in terms of species that were thought to be extinct. Um, there have been a number of NGOs and, and campaigns that have focused on uh, species thought to have been lost. Um, and so far, eight have been found. And I must say, reading this, um, I never thought uh, I needed uh, the Blanco blind salamander in my life, but there you go. Turns out it did. Other good news is that uh, renewable energy, uh, not just uh, amongst climate activists, but actually uh, going into the grid, is increasing at a uh, rapid rate, which is always great news. When we look at the research uh, on climate change and infectious diseases, there's a lot of um, concepts that keep on coming up, uh, vectors, malaria, mosquito, uh, vector-borne diseases, and so we're going to chat a little bit about that. So this graphic um, it just shows the sort of chain of events from the carbon dioxide rising, the global atmosphere warming, the meteorological phenomena like um, the increase in droughts, increase in temperatures and heat waves, um, decrease in hard frosts. And we see in the bottom right hand corner some of the vector borne um, related issues that uh, contribute to the changing nature of these infections that we have to deal with. So the, the to breeding sites um, are, are changing, um, hosting reservoir distributions are changing, and um, longer disease transmission seasons. One of the main examples that um, that we'll have to deal with is, is obviously malaria. There's still um, over 600,000 uh, it's a year, mostly children, uh, pregnant women in Africa. Um, and over the two decades, there was a concerted um, effort, lots of investment going into um, vector control. But now that um, the funding uh, has stagnated or is sort of intermittent, um, malaria is unfortunately resurgent in a number of countries. Um, and the COVID-19 disruptions um, didn't help that um, either. Um, a few months ago, there was a really interesting article um, about climate change uh, affecting malaria in Africa. And they mention um, how mosquitoes are moving to high elevations by about six and a half meters a year. And they're moving further away from the equator um, about five kilometers a year. Um, and this has been shown over the last century. In a lot of regions, uh, malaria is uh, seasonal um, and it responds to short-term changes in rainfall, rainfall humidity, and temperature. Um, and there have been a few uh, studies, um, some in South America, some in, uh, in Africa, just showing what the impact has been of relatively humble uh, temperature increases, 0 0.2 degrees, com compared to the, the goals that we're aiming for, a 0 0.2 degree increase um, has led to uh, malaria shifting to higher altitudes in warmer years, um, which means that the malaria burden will increase at high elevations as uh, the climate warms. And for those news obsessed uh, out there, you would have read about uh, some really, really interesting cases recently of malaria uh, in America. The first reports um, around June, uh, towards the end of June, um, were uh, mostly related to cases, granted there were only a handful of them, but uh, cases uh, of malaria nonetheless in Florida and Texas, um, and these were the first US spread in, in 20 years, and that was Plasmodium vivax. Um, <clears throat> now, considering where Florida um, and Texas um, are, where they, where they found, they um, on a map just uh, one finger breadth above the Tropic of Cancer. So it's uh, really, really close to the Tropic. So the fact that those areas are, are warming and, and experiencing malaria, um, understandable to a point, but 
uh, more recently, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, there was a report of a, a case of Plasmodium falciparum um, in Maryland, which is uh, right next to Washington, D.C., which is all the way up in the northeast uh, part of the U.S. And normally freezing, freezing cold, uh, a lot of snow in the winter, um, and now becoming increasingly hot during the summers um, with this interesting case of malaria having recently been reported. But from what I can tell, we're trying to read up around it. I think the CDC and a lot of people being very cagey about the, the details um, surrounding the case. I don't know if Lucille's on, maybe she knows uh, a little bit more of the behind the scenes information, but certainly what this means is that the things that we up until recently never questioned something like malaria in a place like the United States, we really have to rethink our, our approach to, uh, to these things. A couple of weeks ago, there was a really interesting article uh, in the NEJM looking at the resistance to artemisinins in malaria uh, in Uganda, where they looked at um, just over a dozen sites across the country, um, and they coded, well, they sequenced a, a gene um, coding for artemisinin resistance. Uh, and over the periods that they monitored this from about 2015, 2016 to 2022, um, the prevalence of these resistance markers um, increased. And um, they hypothesized that the emergence and spread facilitated by events leading to high malaria transmission intensity in populations with relatively low immunity and also that uh, malaria control programs um, and the breakdown of these programs contributed potentially to these um, increases in resistance. So <clears throat> this is something maybe not for now, but um, certainly something we have to keep on our radar uh, as uh, a future change in management alert. So watch this space. Dengue is another fascinating uh, viral infection that you know, working in infectious diseases for the last um, 10 years is not really something that we saw a great deal of, but more and more recently, it's becoming um, a lot more common to to hear about it in, in a variety of forms. Thankfully, more in an um, uh, uncomplicated context or a mild uh, or asymptomatic uh, illness, but definitely something that's, uh, that's creeping up um, uh, in our experience. The extrinsic incubation period, this is the time between the ingestion of a pathogen uh, by the vector and the vector becoming infective, uh, and it's inversely proportional to the ambient temperature. So with warming, the mosquito uh, and virus will spread to higher latitudes and altitudes. The incidence will increase and the transmission season um, will lengthen. This uh, photo essay on the right is from the Washington Post showing um, an outbreak in a, in a town or a city in uh, in Peru, and uh, uh, can you imagine the, the impact that uh, an outbreak of dengue would have um, in a in a town like this? So, dengue is an infection that's uh, largely related, or its spread is largely related to travel, trade, or migration. Um, and the mosquitoes uh, implicated by Aedes uh, and Albopictus um, uh, mosquitoes are able to survive. Uh, normally lethal temperatures, and this is going to influence um, their role in future outbreaks. Um, and more recently, we've seen outbreaks um, in Southern Europe when uh, infected travelers pass the pathogen um, onto uh, other secondary uh, infections. Um, this graphic just shows um, the US in 2015 uh, compared to the potential um, prospects of the dengue spread in in 2018. In 2018. Um, Zika is another um, infection, very um, very sort of similar undertones. Um, there's a lot in common with dengue, except uh, obviously our focus is towards pregnant women. And this was uh, our experience in 2015, 2016 with the, the massive epidemic in, in South America. Also, a, a very sort of similar concept, a lot, uh, a lot of it related to the um, vector distribution um, and the impact that it had uh, in areas where these vectors weren't um, necessarily uh, very prevalent. West Nile virus is also a very um, interesting uh, virus, but for, for very different reasons. Its, its life cycle is, is immensely complex 
with bird species and a number of mosquito vectors and bird migration patterns and bird population um, and numbers are, are significantly affecting the transmission of, uh, of West Nile um, in areas that we wouldn't necessarily uh, expect, uh, like um, parts of Europe, for example. When we think about um, waterborne diseases, probably the sort of great prototype is um, uh, is cholera, and uh, the the English in in India uh, documented um, cholera outbreaks very well in the early nineteen hundreds, where uh, from periods that were very dry with high bacterial concentrations in in small uh, dwindling water sources, uh, compared to the flooding that comes with sanitation failure, crowding and displacement. Um, a lot of these uh, sort of seemingly totally discordant um, situations were, were both uh, very often implicated in cholera outbreaks. And cholera seems to thrive on climate change related issues like elevated sea temperatures and increased salinity. Um, and this was taken just from a few days ago in the Washington Post where the CDC warned doctors to look out for um, a rare, deadly flesh-eating bacteria. Um, I, uh, I know that it's, it's, it's quite hard to turn down an article with flesh-eating bacteria in the title. And this was related to um, Vibrio infections, Vibrio bonificus, um, that uh, was having its literal and figurative day in the sun related to uh, warming waters on the northeast uh, part of the US. Um, just because I thought Nilesh might be listening, um, I wanted to include a little bit about fungal infections. Um, this Californian public health announcement uh, was uh, a warning for valley fever where there's uh, an inhalation of fungal spores, not fungal spores, as I put there. Um, and and uh, interestingly, the um, uh, research on Candida auris um, uh, shows that there might be a climate change uh, relationship uh, from increased thermo, thermo tolerance from a response to global warming. Okay, who doesn't love dogs dressed in silly outfits? Quick little timeline cleanse before we move into the last uh, the last phase. So what about our response? We're going to look at things broadly and on an individual level. Now, it's very hard to talk about climate change and the impact of it without um, bringing in things like um, major uh, sort of economic and political uh, disparities um, uh, within uh, regions that are affected by this. A lot of less developed countries bear the greatest burden of uh, vector-borne diseases. Um, obviously, children, pregnant women being um, the the most vulnerable within these situations. And <clears throat> there are a number of uh, public health interventions. So if we look at things in, in a broader broader context um, on a community or society level, uh, there are a lot of uh, different things that can be done um, to try and mitigate the effects of climate change uh, and infectious diseases. So things like vector control programs, uh, surveillance programs, uh, strong public policies, um, uh, you know, which are usually really good on paper, uh, like some of our public policies around climate change in South Africa, but the, the implementation of it, uh, unfortunately, is something that uh, leaves a little bit to be desired. Then on an individual level, um, things like just being aware of vector-borne diseases, so it, it's, it's quite remarkable. How often um, uh, a lot of us still get asked about uh, malaria prophylaxis, malaria risk, uh, yellow fever vaccines in, in people who are uh, due to be traveling to, uh, to certain countries. And I guess rather have it that, that people ask, um, but definitely the awareness ar ar around these things needs to be cranked up uh, majorly. So what are some of the sort of ideological things uh, for the future? Um, now would also be okay, but uh, certainly the sort of big grand things uh, that we can aim for in the future is to look at uh, controlling vectors, 
um, intensify these prevention and control efforts. Um, obviously, things like water and sanitation, we uh, recently had experience of that um, in Gauteng with the cholera, cholera outbreak just outside Pretoria. Um, things like improved weather forecasting and uh, better early warning systems will allow us to, to prepare better. And what about for us as doctors? Um, obviously, diagnosing and treating diseases earlier and removing the, the source of infection that's available for, um, for vectors uh, would be a good place to start. And then, of course, vaccinations. <clears throat> Very hard to speak about climate change and infectious diseases without, without mentioning um, the One Health approach, which is the um, philosophy of uh, humans, the environment, and animal health really being um, intricately linked. It's just really, really difficult to, you know, it's actually impossible to, to untangle each of these elements um, when thinking about climate change and infectious diseases and try and focus on um, one element at a time, which is just, uh, um, uh, uh, will be a recipe for disaster. Um, I know that uh, Lucille and the NRCD have been uh, major protagonists uh, in terms of getting um, the One Health uh, approach uh, to gain a bit of traction in South Africa. The big question that we always have to ask ourselves is, okay, instead of, you know, I, as Evan Shul can't really um, uh, set up a surveillance system, it's not really within my skill set, um, but what are things that I can do on an individual level? Um, to help fight the climate crisis. And the UNEP, the UN Environment Program, um, came up with very simple, um, very uh, sort of catchy uh, list of things to do. So number one, spread the word. That's what we're doing today. I'm telling you, and you're going to go and tell others. Check. Number two, you've got to keep up the political pressure. In South Africa, um, while uh, some of the policies might look good on paper, the implementation um, is very poor. Uh, and there are a lot of NGOs that are really doing amazing work to try and keep up um, the political pressure on trying to get uh, trying to get things done. Transform your transport. So unfortunately in South Africa, electric vehicles are prohibitively expensive. Um, riding a bike uh, in Johannesburg is not uh, not exactly the safest thing to do, but maybe those listening in, in other parts of the country, maybe you can transform uh, your transport. Rain in power use, well, that's um, that's been done indirectly through through load shedding, but also uh, um, I think uh, power and energy uh, concepts have have really sort of taken hold for for a lot of us in South Africa with with load shedding. Uh, and made us think a lot about um, the way we use um, electricity. Tweak your diet. So this is um, a, a graphic on the right-hand side from uh, from the Economist. It really just shows the uh, carbon uh, emissions for uh, a variety of the different foods that we eat. Um, and we see far and away the the, the most commonly implicated is, uh, is beef, cow's milk, a lot of animal-related products. Um, and so there's a there's a big push to advocate for a, a plant based diet. Shop local and buy sustainable. Um, don't waste food. Dress climate smart. So there's a lot of um, really uh, cheap, easy to buy, uh, very wearable but short term clothes that a lot of people use, and, and that has. Uh, uh, and, and very easy to to dispense once it's used. A lot, and a lot of these um, uh, clothing manufacturers and the materials that they use contribute uh, enormously to, to climate change. Obviously, planting trees uh, and to try and focus on planet-friendly uh, investments. What about um, for us in clinical practice? So healthcare worker education, that's what we're doing now. Um, we've got to be aware of uh, emerging and uh, uh, sort of re-emerging re infections. Uh, and there are a lot of amazing uh, resources that, that help um, those of us in the field uh, just keep track of, uh, of these changes that really happen uh, at breakneck speed. Um, as doctors working in infectious diseases, we, we're quite familiar with, with being uh, advocates and, and activists. Uh, some of you were HIV act, act, uh, activists back in the days, 
uh, we were all recently COVID activists, and now um, we have to add another badge to our blazer uh, by being uh, climate change activists. Vaccines are um, an amazing uh, uh, intervention that's uh, quite simple and the impact is, is enormous. The IPCC feels that a successful vaccine uh, development and uptake will have the potential to offset uh, a lot of the effects of climate change on vector-borne diseases. So how will, will all of this change our practice? So for those of us working in infectious diseases, we have to be aware of how our pre-travel advice recommend, recommendations change, um, including vaccines and prophylaxis. Post-travel, so when we see patients who are coming from certain areas with uh, a fever, very often we have a very particular differential diagnosis in mind. We're now gonna have to start to broaden that where we have to uh, sort of break out of our preconceived uh, lists that we work through where something like West Nile virus has to be included in someone returning from, from Europe uh, and maybe considering malaria in people who have been to America. Um, and also our management protocols are likely to change. So just to summarize, within um, infectious diseases, there are already huge life gains that have been made um, in terms of controlling ID-related morbidity and mortality. So the threats of infectious diseases or infectious diseases are likely to come from emerging and re-emerging infections. Climate change, um, urbanization, changing land use, all of these are to increase the risk of emerging infections uh, patterns of disease. Um, a couple of weeks ago, um, Tulio had an article entitled World Climate Change and Rise to Pandemics, and I think very, very clearly the answer to that is yes. So, as a result, look alive. ID, advice, and general schooling. And thanks all. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, Robin, I don't know if there's anything you want to add at this point or uh, Evan's yeah. timeline clear uh, timeline cleanses were, were much needed. <laughs> um yeah, thank you again to Evan for the um, invitation and this kind of collaboration. Um, I really enjoyed the research I did in discussing this with Evan. Um, I mean, I'm a geologist and an earth scientist. So for me, even just to listen to the um, presentation today was really fascinating. Um, so no, I don't have anything specific to add. Um, I'm very happy to answer any questions if anyone has any particular questions about climate change. I suppose perhaps the one thing I would add to Evan's introduction is that the greenhouse gases are very important. That's why Earth is habitable. Like Mars doesn't have a, um, the greenhouse gases and Mars is, you know, has huge temperature variations even on a day night cycle and is uninhabitable. So the green, initially the greenhouse gases are very important, but it's burning fossil fuels. Um, and so, I mean, in South Africa, every time you drive your car, that petrol emits, you know, your um, exhaust fumes contain carbon dioxide. And every time you turn on a light, our electricity is from burning coal, which is a fossil fuel, and emits huge amounts of CO2. And it's that extra CO2 in the atmosphere that's causing the warming. So that's, um, and the heat has been trapped by the greenhouse gases. So th that's what I would just add is the link between burning fossil fuels and global warming. But I'm happy to take any other questions. And yeah, thank you again. Yeah, thanks, Robin. Um, if anyone has got any questions, just stick up their hand at the moment. Um, I seem to, I'm just going to stop your video, Evan, just in case, because um, we seem to lose you occasionally. Um, that may help. Um, 
Oh, we've got a question in the chat. Um, many people will say about climate change, it's an inevitable cycle. It's happened before, happened again, that the impact from humans is limited. So, well, Kim, you've really opened that can of worms for us. <laughs> Robin, I don't know if you want to give a, a couple of sentences to reply to that. <laughs> yeah, this is a classic question. Thank you for bringing it up. Um, so, yes, you're right. The one thing we know about the Earth's climate is that it's varied a lot in the past and that it's basically never been in a steady state, that there's always been huge variations. But the other thing that we know about past climate change is the rate of change. And we're looking at changes taking place on a thousand to 10,000 year timescale. So the rate of change that we've seen in the last 80 years on earth is completely unprecedented and never before have the has the concentration of the atmosphere changed so rapidly so we are moving into completely uncharted territory and um we've also never had such large populations of people so yes the climate has changed and there has been impacts on people in the past i work in human evolution, and this is one of our major questions, is how well adapted our distant relatives were to changing climates. So yes, people have always been susceptible to the world around them changing, but we're pitching into you know, completely unprecedented change. and We've never had as many people who are going to experience that. Yeah, no, agreed fully. Um, and Evan, I guess one of the questions as well, well, not questions, but one of the interesting things, I suppose, of of the types of diseases which are becoming more prevalent, say, with climate change, um, there's obviously a very big spectrum, like you said, but so many of them appear to be also the sort of diseases that affect predominantly low and middle income settings. Um, and I think, again, it kind of talks to the need to get our act together from the sort of things that we know already work given that climate change is, um, you know, is, is is having an impact. In other words, as you said, things like vaccination or mass drug administration for certain helminth infections and, you know, the, the sort of low cost, high impact interventions, which we know already work and, and just become more and more um, necessary when the effects of climate change get factored in as well. may have lost Evan. Evan, can you hear us? Oh, I've lost him. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. I hey, think, hey. you know, those simple low-hanging fruit interventions are really... I think those those uh, real low-hanging fruit interventions are things that we within an ID will need to uh, really focus on, considering that, you know, major infrastructural um interventions uh sanitist things are, are not going to be changing anytime soon and if anything climate changes i'm going to antagonize them even further so you know i think it it it, it puts um a, quite a responsibility on our already uh, overburdened shoulders to to focus on a lot of these uh real basic basic interventions Cool. All right. Thanks very much. So uh, thanks to, to Evan uh, for a really, really great overview of a, a complex topic, but a really important one. Um, and again, like we said, speaks to the importance of One Health and speaks to the importance of some of the simple interventions as well. And thanks as much uh, as also as well for, for Robin um, Pickering's in, uh, uh, expert comments at the end there, which was really lovely and rounded off the topic nicely. So thank you both.